thank you very much, uh, Peter and Mama, for organizing this event. Uh, my paper is entitled Immanence in Poiesis, or Life as a Text. And so I will deal with mimesis uh, in a very special sense, not life converted into a text, into text, but life as already being a text. Poiesis is, is the art of narrative and the art of constructing, uh, mainly through a text. My topic, as first announced, was too vast, so I reduce, reduced it and I decided to concentrate myself on one narrative genre with regard to this question of immanence and on one reading of that genre that I know well and uh, on which I have worked, I mean, uh, the biography. Biography is the most horrible genre if we consider the lie of all narrative. It pretends converting life into text. I will try to show that if we can reverse this proposition and see in the biographical genre um, not a false conversion, but something genuine that only makes a translation from one reality, factual, to another, textual. And if I can affirm that there is an immanentist tradition of the biographical genre, then my demonstration will be true for all Western narratives and novels, because a priori, biography is the most transcendental and Aristotelian genre. And this is true since the structuralist period in France. I wouldn't have time to develop ahead the immanentist tradition, foundations, and essence of literature before structuralism. But it has its roots in the American novel, I think, as Deleuze saw it too. And this immanentist tradition in Western poesy seems to me close to the Oriental China's poesy. Um, I can only refer here uh, to my forthcoming book entitled uh, La Chambre d'à Côté, The Room Above, forthcoming next, next year, that deals with that subject, and to an interview I gave with François Julien last April in Paris um, that you can find online. Among the structuralists, I will focus on Barthes because he raised the possibility of reading life as a text and therefore of writing it. For the practice of life writing cannot be taken for granted and is in principle an impossible enterprise. After all, how can these two heterogeneous materials, the factual and textual, be reconciled? That is the very question of the poesis. Surely all writing involves a kind of death, the creation of a fixed form. My genre, biography, however, processes this ambition in its very name, biography, bios uh, writing, bios poiesis. Um, quite unexpectedly, biography is uh, as free uh, and open as a genre can be, if one considers that it has no established form. To my mind, Barthes offers the possibility, through his life and his writing, of a genuine biogra biography, quite literary, an exercise in life writing. And for the second reason that is that his life can be read as a text. Biography occupies a particular place among the factual genre. Situated somewhere between philosophy, history, and literature, practiced by writers, philosophers, and historians, Sartre, um, as quoted, Zweig for Flaubert, Zweig, Gide, and of course Barthes, discredited in turn by the doxa of French theory, rehabilitated once again in recent years, since we get out of the two texts, and in the literary domain, since critics called into question Jeunet's proposition in fiction and diction that only fiction can be an object of study for narratology. Biographical writing therefore poses serious questions, both complex and fundamental, because the question poiesis itself, and in its essence, what does it mean to write a life or life, to transform life into a text? Does the word biography denote the process of writing life or life in the process of writing? Biography forces us to address this fascinating mixture of two different substances, that of reality, um, as I said, concrete world, life, death, and that of the text. It is precisely the question of poiesis and of the poetics, the question that obsessed Aristotle, that of the mimesis. 
Does the biographical object consist only of a subject or is it an individual? How can we respect the openness and movement of a life when narration, narration forecloses meaning and signifies from the perspective of death? Writing a biography raises a fundamental problem of writing the other, evoked by Levinas, and central to the discussions of those philosophers who have been drawn to the biographical question. Blanchot, Barthes, Derrida, Deleuze, and even reorientated towards the more political dimension of life narratives, Foucault. It is most surprising that these structuralists, supposedly responsible for the anti-biographical doxa that followed after their work, were in fact the very philosophers and writers who truly and most deeply considered the genre. It is significant that uh, Jean-Pierre Martin, in his recent essay criticizing the anti-biographical doxa, draws on both Barthes and Lacan for their defense of biography. Besides, the practice of biography is closely linked to certain anthropological questions, in particular in its gesture of renunciation. We do not reach the man, we merely construct a narrative, even biographem, Fragments of biography in Barthes uh, vocabulary, vocabulary are themselves the construction of a narrative. This is the very basis of Lacan's defense of the genre. Biography brings to the fore, as Blanchot writes, I quote, a relation in which the unknown would be affirmed, made manifest, even exhibited, disclosed, and under what aspect precisely in that which it keeps unknown, unquote. My idea, no, the idea of Barth's own is very simple. It postulates that life is a text. In doing so, it inverts a biographical doxa. Life does not become a text. Life is constituted as a text. It is a text in the process of becoming. We should say more precisely that its very substance is the texture. So my first point will be life as a text and biography according to Barthes' theory. As a writer, Barthes was obsessed by the biographical question, especially in the final period of his life, the novelistic period. The biographical term, therefore, takes hold around the beginning of the novelistic period with the reflection on the signifier in Empire of Science and especially in the um, preface to Sad Fourier Loyola in 1971. At first, Barthes' passion for biography is centered on pleasure. It produces the pleasure of text and it is dependent on the notion of biographem. I quote, for me, the sudden about face occurred at the time of the pleasure, pleasure of text. Weakening of the theoretical superego, return of the much loved text. I also thought I could detect here and there a fondness among some of my peers for what I could be called biographical nebulae. That biographical curiosity then developed freely in me." Unquote. Biography in Barthesian language resembles erotography, as he claimed with regard to the life of Roger Laporte. And um, my quotation was a little long, but what then is the concept of erotography that Barth discovers in the early 70s. In 71, Barth published Sad Fourier Loyola, which reopens a field previously addressed in Michelet par lui-même, that of the biographical question. This issue does not come to displace Barth's passion for language. What fascinates Barth in the biographical question is still, in fact, concentrated with language. It is notably, notably the creation of the biographem, biographem. Furthermore, as he makes clear in his preface, the object of the, his biographical writing were all logotet, founders of language. I would like to develop two points here, the meaning of the emergence of the question of life and the relation of this question to language. When Barth addresses the biographical question, both in theory and in practice, he dispenses with the traditional biographical topoi instead creating a space in his writing in which life appears as a succession of moments that incessantly outplays any unity. Just as for Sartre, just quoted, the subject is first and foremost unknowable. 
I called for if, through a twisted dialectic, the text, destroyer of all subject, contains a subject to love. That subject is dispersed, somewhat like the ashes withdrew, withdrew into the wind after death. Bart refuses a prerogative taken for granted in biographical writing of imposing a retrospective unity on a life, effectively that of the novel, of a coher coherent narrative. He refuses poiesis, in a way. When he defines life as a text in the unpublished frag fragments of Roland Barthes par Roland Barthes, he has no intention of assimilating life with the unity of the oeuvre, of assimilating the object with its transformation into writing. Rather, he considers that the object is already textual in nature and that biography is in reality a hermeneutic, a reading, a rewriting. For example, this year, I quote him, sorry. For example, this year, uh, it's 1972, he, Bart speaks of himself, has produced a unique text by just juxtaposing different sorts of so social engagement, engagements. Here and there, subjects emerge unexpectedly from disparate, incompatible contexts. This breaks the monotonous law of biographical discourse. It produces a sort of textual cacophony. The diary is proposed as the immediate form for writing that would allow the writer to make his life into an oeuvre, his oeuvre, he said. But this solution is, he says, too unsatisfactory and will be adopted only in passing. Furthermore, Bart's novelistic theory is founded on the individual detail, the author who is, in three different forms, the object of Sad for Yellow Yola. And it's not the object of a biography, but a novelistic object for him. The author who leaves his text and comes into our life has no unity. He is a mere plural of calms, the site of a few tenuous details, yet the source of vivid novelistic grimmerings. The paradoxically simple plural here becomes a unity, and all the more strongly in this case since it involves three biographies in one. The realities of the novelistic and of the individual detail penetrate one another. The novelistic and life are consubstantial of one substance. And in this respect, the novelistic as poiesis is distinct from the novel. The novelistic is a mode of notation of investment, interest in the reality of everyday life, in people, in everything that happens in life, unquote. A way of writing life. The novelistic is therefore a way of dividing up reality, he says. This was the moment, this was the moment of the well-known shift in Barth's work from science to pleasure, which would lead to the pleasure of facts in, 70, in 1973. There is a fundamental connection between fiction and the biographem, as he writes later with regard to anamnesis. I quote, I call anamnesis the action, a mixture of pleasure and effort, perf performed by the subject in order to recover without magnifying or sorry, sentimentalizing it, a tenuity of memory. It is the haiku itself, the Japanese poem, it is the haiku itself. The biographem is nothing but a fastidious anamnesis the one I lend to the author I love. Anamnesis, like the biographem, is, ex is exempt from meaning. It is an immanent state, and it proceeds of poien. The fictional is therefore central to Barth's conception, even as it is rejected by Foucault, for example, in La vie des hommes en femmes. The symbolic is crushed by an imaginary that relegs the real since childhood childhood to the domain of uncertainty. A certainty. For Bart, biographies must therefore remain on the surface and on no account should there be signs of meaning, as he explained it, in order to justify the, absen the absence of life of Loyola. And he said that only the body is the object of the biographies. 
whereas biography is a story diffracted from the body, without the consistency of the novel, but nonetheless closer to Proust than to Lacan, for whom there are clusters of biographical signs that produce meaning. It is a story in movement, and specifically the movement of writing, of life writing. Biographer must be arbitrary signifiers, which then lead us to the metaphor of life as a text. So I will quote him. In 1973, seminar is entirely devoted to this biographical approach. And it contains the explicit statement of the principles that emerge gr gradually from the linguistic conception of life as writing and, for bi and from biography. Um, the fragment is entitled Life as a Text. Life as a Text. This, is, this will become banal. Perhaps it already is. If we do not specify, it is a text to be produced, not deciphered. Deci deciphered to be produced, it's poem, already stated at least twice before. In, it's still Barthes who writes. In 1942 and in 1966. The idea is, is stated again in the prepar preparation of the novel, so at the end of life's, um, Barthes' life. And it's, the fragment is entitled Life as Work. It involves a writer making his life into a work, his work, Poyen, obviously the immediate, immediate, immediate form, without mediation, of the solution of the diary. And he, say, he, he adds, I'll say at the end of this development what that solution is unsatisfactory. Elsewhere, he replaces the text with the sentence. However, what matters for me is the proposition itself and the task of defining life as a text or a life text. I will now leave Barth's theory and try to define my own conception of the immanentist poesis of a life text. And for that, I will take Barth's life as an example because it is absolutely a text. So from life writing, the text written by his life, to the writing of my text, um, of his life text. I will take Barth's proposition quite literally and push it into its logical extreme. This approach is revolution, revolutionary. It reverses the Aristotelian poesis and also consistent with all of the structuralist thought regarding the signifier. signifier. What interests them, as Barth states in Empire of Science, I quote, is the possibility of a difference, of a revolution in the propriety of symbolic systems. Yet the confrontation with the other in the form of a text, but not reduced to his oeuvre, is for the biographer the essential experience of a difference in symbolic systems which here represents perhaps one of the few critical methods of approaching Barthes' suit, one possible way of avoiding mere paraphrase of Barthes. As Benveniste and Saussure have shown, we can never grasp the framework of suit itself, only the categories of language that govern the format of reality. What we refer, at, sorry, what we refer to as reality. Just as for suit, the person and the life that we seek to grasp are a language which is not to be de decrypted, but is rather the very condition of thinking that life. As Barth says, life is a text in motion. And Solers writes in Logic in 1968, one can dream of something that would be a genuine biography of or writing, a genuine biography, conforming to Baudelaire's wish. Biography and fiction will serve to explain and to verify, so to speak, the mysterious adventures of the mind. Biography writing that is alive and in movement, following a logic of fiction. Movement and fiction are both the characteristics of poetics and life. 
Just as Bart created the fictive nation of Japan in Empire of Science, so I must pursue a fiction in order to create a formal system, a live text. Writing is not primary, primarily narrating or quoting or providing commentary. It is not a matter of being inscribed in a genre, but rather it is an active process of inscribing, of establishing a certain path. In Derrida's terms, one might speak of the itinerant work of the trace, producing and not following, following a wood, the trace that traces, the trace that for, forges its own path. Unquote. We are concerned here with movement and with the body, and it is a question of writing the bodily life of thought, said Derrida. The writer engaged his life in their writing, and the biography of the mind, contemporary with the writing itself, is itself a constant motion, in constant motion, sorry. We must also take account of the mind's residue of reading and the imprint of this residue on the life in general, as Marielle Massé discussed in a recent um, book. So how can we reconcile this, reconcile this din dynamic quality and the idea that life is a text. How can we contemplate this text in motion? I shall not proceed as Bart does in Sad Fourier Loyola by reducing the movement of writing to a reading of the oeuvre or, and by limiting the life to the biographer. I have to define what a text is at first and I choose a structuralist definition, the one of Lévi-Strauss and ja Jacobson in the um, reading of Baudelaire, Lesha. A text is characterized by a closure brought about by an eventual movement of return, the first definition, the closure, and uh, the second one is an invariant. All the parts of the text conform to the same repeated structure or invariant which forms a closure while remaining open the very nature of a text, which forms textual unities in the midst of the book of the life, and the same structure is operational over the whole ensemble of Bart's life. By an essentially, an essentially reasonable mode of functioning, text, textual unities are generated by the text itself. I have described this invariant with regard to Bart's life as a generative void, or a matrix, which is a void. It is based on the principle that both events and writing are, both events and writings that are from the same substance, um, are structured in such a way as to fill an initial void. The photographic metaphor of a negative followed by a process of development therefore functions as the major metaphor of uh, his life the major metaphor of the life text. At least, this is true of the first part of this text, which comes to a close in 1977 with the death of the mother and the beginning of a vita nova, inaugur inaugurating a second structure characterized by the failure of all, of any, of any compensation and by the attainment of another way of living, another way of reflecting on the sign, which Eric Marty has but baptized following Blanchot as the right to death. So, uh, the reading of the life texts uh, will um, lead me to um, define a matrix, a generative void. This is a major invariant of Barth's life structure as a text. In the beginning, there is a void. On 12 November 1915, at 9 in the morning, in Cherbourg, Roland Gérard Barthes was born. I quote him, I was born, as I am told, 12 November at 9 in the morning at Cherbourg, a simple garrison stopping point for my father, an officer in the American Navy mobilized as a midshipman. This birth is a blind spot, as I am told, a void. The fact is in itself banal. The act of being born rarely has any significance, except in the realm of myth. But in this case, the, the insignificance 
the significance is it significant. Bart's birth is a void of meaning par excellence, both symbolically and even geographically. For example, if the birth had occurred several weeks later, it would have fitted neatly to the family mythology. Um, because in his family, everybody is uh, born uh, to date, um, uh, linked with the number 16. Uh, he, I put him, my grandfather was born in, um, in 1716 under Louis XVI. My father was born in 1816 and I was born in um, um, 1876 in France, it's 76, it's, you, you can hear the word says. Uh, the play is too, so the date, he, he missed the date. He, he was born in 1915. Um, the place too held no particular significance. The two branches of Bart's ancestry are diametrically opposed in the northeast and uh, the southwest of France. But Cherbourg and the north are fundamentally excluded from any symbolic attachment. I quote him, city which I do not know since I, quite literally, never set foot there, being only two months old when I left it. However, uh, this same unsymbolic north was to be the location of a crucial event, the death of the father. Yet, yet once again, this would take the form of a void, albeit a void transformed into a, albeit a void transformed into a determining and fundament and foundational sorry element. The lack becomes a generative absence. And throughout Barth's life, it serves systematically as the foundation of all construction. The absence of social status as a word of the taste, of the state, sorry. The total absence of money until uh, 1953. The absence of the opportunity to study due to the onset on tuberculosis. The absence of an official post, the absence of the necessary qualifications to get a post, a university post, all of this leads him to the writing of a masterful oeuvre, constantly renewed and innovative, to unparalleled fame and to the Collège de France in 1977. In Bart's long engagement in structuralism, I find a particular du dualism associated with the generative void, or rather with its failure, to which I shall return. In the opposite between science and literature, Barth chooses the neutral. The significance of the choice of structuralism and of its practice is that writing itself becomes the empty center. Barth discovers in the infinite search of writing the same principle of the generative void that structures his life. But it is a search which never reaches its goal because it is precisely caught between two poles. It is an empty, an empty center, a black hole. At two points, the failure to compensate, to compensate for a void or absence leads to a serious ruptures in Barth's life, both of which relate to writing. Um, I will develop the first one in 1968. Uh, the second one is the death of uh, his mother, and that is uh, the, rever the reversal point of his life um, in 1977. But uh, first, May 68, May 68 in Paris. Um, it represents a turning point by dismissing structuralism as a whole, but especially the avant-garde exposed by Barth himself, May 68 deprives Barth of, its, of his own structure. In fact, May 68 deprives him of his very state of exclusion. For the first time, the complete feeling of the generative void creates a new void the process of compensation is defeated by its own success. The paradoxical situation of structuralism in the movement of May 68 plays out, in Barth's case, in the life of an individual. This paradox, which undermines the imaginary construction of Barth's re relation to work and to creation, 
can be stated in literary terms. May 68, May 68 does not recognize his signature. In poetic terms, regarding the life text, May 68 is effectively a plagiarism of Barth, which is confirmed, confirmed sorry, by the false attribution of the famous phrase, phrase sorry, structures do not take to the streets which Bart could very well have spoken up, but, as it happens, did not, and which turns against him. So, structures do not take to the streets, nor does Bart, used to say, uh, the, the students that hated Bart at the time. Um, in this world, vicious in its own way, where the power of speech was dominant, speech and rhetorics, rather than writing and poetics, the terrorism of speech, which is also the opposite, opposite of the absence of speech in Japan, which Barth loved. Speech takes on the very form of plagiarism, plagi plagi plagiarism, the pastiche of his own writing. Barth hated uh, May 68, too. The phrase, nor does Barth, bitterly signs the rejection of one who is defined by exclusion. It excludes the rejected. The author's first response is simple, to recentrate, to recenter his writing on the self, on the I. But in reality, this revelation is more complex. But search for the secret of writing over the previous 10 years of structuralist work was not in vain. He finds a response to the biographical mystery in a line of continuity from structuralism, a labor to discover the relation between the sign and life and to break free of psychological reflex. But he also makes a change in direction. He adopts a critical distance which allows him to hold up an ironic mirror to the modernity that excludes him. Whether it is structuralism or the Sartrean discourse, of a return to humanism, whose followers unanimously criticize Barth at this time. His reorientation towards the self will lead him to writing S.Z. and Empire of Science, which works in which the continuity from structuralism is manifest, but a version, a version, new version of structuralism caught in a deforming, ironic mirror in which rehabilitates, in a way, the poiesis in which he rehabilitates uh, the poiesis. Finally, with regard to the turning point of May 68, I have maintained discreetly a somewhat controversial idea. Paradoxically, the very thing that Barth sought in structuralism was a writing of life, biographical writing. After all, he was not the only one, as others in the structuralist fold, showed showed the same tendency over the course of the 70s to reconcile the sign and life. Nonetheless, in 1968, he produced the well-known article, The Death of the Author, the growing work of the ideo ideo ideology of the structuralist period, which was read uh, for a long time afterwards as a re rejection of biography, but it was um, a false uh, reading. In his article, he established the role of writing as destruction of all origin, not a voice, but the opening of voices converging into the reader. The loss of identity of the writing subject is the very condition of the birth of writing, he said, the death of the author for the birth of the text. Around the same time, Barr discovers his own writing, born through the death of the author, with the loss of the writing body. At the, time, at the same time, to discuss this loss, he uses the very terms that constitute his own biography, the neutral and its photographic metaphor, or black and white. So I, I think I won't have time to develop um, the photographic metaphor that is one of um, the figures that um, define life's, Bart's life as a text. Um, I'll try, if I have enough time, I don't know. Five minutes. Okay, uh, I'll try to, well, I will 
just summarized um, the textual investigation or how can we identify life in an underneath text of the earth because I had to see a text in his life and what did I have? I had facts and I have the oeuvre, the texts. So um, I try to identify a life as an underneath text of the oeuvre, a cryptogrammatic text in a Lacanian reading, which is a, this text is the biography, it's a graphy of the bios, the bios poien. Um, this perspective functions on the principle of the figure in the carpet of Henry James, in a way, or um, on, of the anamorphic, anamorphic skull in uh, The Ambassadors by Holbein. Um, this, these are the models of a biography or a life text. Um, I, I'll, I'll just give a short example uh, before my conclusion. Um, it's in SZ. I, I should have a poem, PowerPoint would be more. Um, so SZ, in this title, you have the name of brothers, of the of Bart's brother, uh, Salzedo. Um, in Sal Salzedo is writing with an S and a Z, and of course, uh, it's not um, by chance. Um, so my search begins in chapter 27 of FZ, on account of the birth of Michel Salzedo, uh, which was which was born in uh, 1927. Uh, this connection is made possible by the polyvalence of relations, the leveling of all relations in the life text. The reading of this chapter exposes the figure in the carpet of the text. Uh, and what is it? It is the figure of the unwanted child. Um, so I, I won't have time to develop all uh, uh, the demonstration, but um, in as said, uh, the chapter number 27 is entitled Antithesis to the Marriage. And it is a chapter, a chapter against marriage and against, um, well, it deals with an unwanted child and an horrible child, which is something like an avorton, um, uh, um, a, a dead child, and uh, well, his mother, it was not his real brother, his mother had an adventure with a man called Salcedo, and um, the child, um, uh, so Bart's brother, that he always loved, and that to whom he gave all his money, and that is still alive now, and is still living on Bart's money. Mm. <laughs> um, this child is supposed to be loved by Bart, but in the chapter 27 of SZ, you discover that um, Bart wrote something uh, about an unwanted child. Uh, so that is a cryptogrammatic uh, text of the earth, and you, there is a lot, a lot, of uh, cryptograms like that in Bart's earth, text in, underneath text in which life is inscribed um, and um, a, a, a meaning of life is, um, is uh, hidden. So to conclude, uh, the theory of life as a text and its application in the writing reverse the proposition of the poetics. It affirms the existence of a Western tradition of the immanentist uh, narrative. I have also defined the properties of the life text that is sketched out, but always in motion, in, by Bart's life. It is not a text to be interpreted or read, but to be defined in its textual, textual essence by its two constitutive elements, the invariant of the structure of void, whose functioning is dispersed throughout all parts of the text, and the final reversal, the denouement, uh, in 1977, 
which is clearly manifested uh, in the photographic metaphor, and I had no time to develop that. Um, I next set out the method I followed by exploring the text, treating the texture and the factual as being essentially homogeneous elements of the life text, and the Freudian, more Lacanian, uh, but undogmatic reading of cryptogrammatic texts, such as SZ. I just um, give a very uh, quick example. I therefore sought to provide my own reading, one possible reading, not of the life of Bart, which I have merely presented as a text, but of what a life oeuvre could be, a real poiesis, when taken in a purely textual sense and also to show what it means or what it can mean to take seriously the idea that the real and the textual consist of one and the same matter, that of language. Thank you. <laughs>